to the family, relatives, and friends, we as members of the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks are here to pay a tribute of affection and honor to our brother, Steve Letzinger, who has passed through the shadows into everlasting peace. At this time, we should pause in thoughtful review of the principles we uphold. The faith we follow teaches us to live in bonds of charity with all mankind. To do justice to one another raises the standard of human excellence everywhere. Brotherly love is a torch that sheds light over the whole pathway of life. Fidelity inspires us to be true to one another and to treasure the memory of the departed. In fraternal recognition of the part borne by our brother in all our work and bowing to the decree of an all-wise God, I ask you to listen in reverence to the chime of the hour of eleven with us the hour of remembrance. Is the hour of recollection. You have heard the tolling of eleven strokes. This is to impress upon you that with us the hour of eleven has a tender significance. Wherever elks may roam, whatever their lot in life may be, when this hour falls upon the dial of night, the great heart of elkdom swells and throbs. It is the golden hour of recollection, the homecoming of those who wander, the mystic roll call of those who will come no more. Living or dead, elks are never forgotten, never forsaken. Morning and noon may pass them by. The light of day sink heedlessly in the west. But ere the shadows of midnight shall fall, the chimes of memory will be peeling forth the friendly message to our absent member. To our absent members. The chaplain will lead us in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we come to thee and humbly ask thy blessing upon this service. May the passing of our brother inspire new devotion to the fraternal duties entrusted to our keeping. May those who mourn be comforted with thy tender love and mercy. From the darkness of this hour, lead us to the sunshine of thy presence. As thou art with us through life, so bring us at last where we are united in bonds of eternal peace. Amen. Amen. The inner guard will call the name of our departed brother. Steve, let's say it. In vain we call. He has passed into the light which is beyond the valley of the shadow of death. The places that have known him shall know him no more. And again we realize that in the midst of life we are in death. That he who watches over all our destinies will again, on the last great day, unite the chain of fraternal love so recently broken. <clears throat> Esteemed leading night, in summing up the life work of our departed brother, what record shall be made in the name of charity? I testify to his faithful adherence to the cause of charity. Esteemed loyal knight, how shall his devotion to justice be measured? Just the, as the just deserve justice, I declare that he was faithful to justice. Esteemed lecturing knight, Representing the principles of brotherly love, what is the testimony from your station? 
by the fraternal ties that bound him to us, I pronounce him faithful to brotherly love. Elijah Squire, what is your tribute to our brother's patriotism? He who loved his country, his country's flag, has not lived in vain. This flag is first in our hearts as loyal Americans, and it guards our altar as loyal Elks. May its clustering stars and streaming light guide the immortal soul of our departed brother on his journey through eternity. As a tribute to his fidelity, I bring the unfading amaranth encircled by the clinging ivy. These tokens we deposit with him, enduring friendship, the amaranth typifying our belief in the immortality of the soul, and the ivy symbolizing brotherly love. Sleep, my brother, and peace be with you. My friends, the incident of death is not more mysterious than the incident of birth. We born to die, and we die that we may live. This philosophy of human existence remains unchanged throughout the passing centuries. The birth of an individual does not greatly impress us, but when death invades our ranks, we are appalled. It is not life that causes us to pause, but loss of it. Likewise, a clinging faith in immortality has been our solace and inspiration since the first of the flight of time began. Although a natural and inevitable event, the final summons always comes to those we love with a blow that seems to crush our hearts. We think gentle thoughts, we speak tender words, we halt, we wonder, we reason, and with faith, we become reconciled as we realize that the loss of life is not the end, but a beginning. In this simple and reverent ceremony, it is not my purpose to deliver a personal eulogy of our brother, who no longer answers when his name is called. Steve Letzinger, as an American citizen, responsive to every duty of citizenship and brotherhood, he took his vow before the antlers. He had tested his obligation upon the great book of law. He pledged allegiance to the American flag. True, our brother has journeyed away from us. His dream ship, frail or staunch, has sailed to another shore. The clock of his days has stopped upon its dial. The monocle's shadows mark 11. With us, the golden hour of recollection. Whatever may have been his accomplishments, we are his treasurers. We will cherish his good deeds, forget his faults, and inscribe his name upon the tablets of love and memory. As he was true to us, let us be true to him. Speaking for the surviving members of his lodge, I say goodbye. Goodbye until the hour of 11 shall regularly return. Thou art, I am, I am thou, thy name shall never be forgot. May we act with charity, justice, brotherly love, and fidelity. Any members, I now ask that you pay tribute to our departed brother by leaving with him the clinging ivy, symbolizing brotherly love, after which the service will be concluded. Any members that feel that want to come up and leave the ivy there? <laughs>
Hi, my name is Abby, and I am a chaplain with Brighton Hospice. And Reverend Judy and I just want to thank each of you for coming this evening to support Patty and the family. And uh, just as together we remember and celebrate the life of Stephen L. Letzinger. But this time is not only about honoring and celebrating Steve's life, it's also a time for us to share our sadness and our grief, and a time to receive comfort from God and from each other. Psalm 46 verses one through three reminds us that God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. And then in John 11:25, 25, Jesus said these words, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Please join me in prayer. Our great and merciful God, who is indeed our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble, we gather this day to remember and celebrate the life of Steve Letzinger. We come with a mixture of emotions, deep sorrow and sadness because of our loss and the emptiness we feel because Steve is no longer present with us. For some, it indeed feels as though the world has been shaken. We come with hearts full of thankfulness and joy because of the many ways that Steve touched our lives with his love and kindness, his humor and his orneriness, and we are grateful for each unique and special relationship that he had with us as husband or father, as brother or papa, as uncle, cousin, as coworker, or simply as friend. We are grateful for who we have become because of spending time with Steve in those special relationships. We take comfort in your promise that those who believe in you, even though they die, yet will they live. And we ask that you fill our hearts with trust in you, that we may without out fear commit those who are dear to us to your unfailing love, both for this life and for the life to come. We ask that you be with us during these coming moments as we remember and as we remember and celebrate Steve's life. We ask that you continue to be with us in the coming days, weeks, and months as we continue to grieve our loss. Perhaps in a strange way, we even thank you for our grief because we know such grief means we have experienced a relationship of deep love with Steve. We cling to your promise that tells us, blessed are those who mourn because they shall be comforted. And we ask for you to indeed comfort us this day as we spend time together as Steve's family and friends, remembering him, honoring him, and celebrating his life. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned in my greeting, I'm a hospice chaplain, and certainly one of the greatest and most sacred privileges that I have in that role is to walk with and companion individuals and their loved ones as they approach the end of their life. But even as I say that, I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding about what hospice is. Many people think hospice is about dying, but if hospice services really start early when they should, you'll find that it's really more about living than it is about dying. And Steve was one of those individuals who began services early enough that we could focus on living and on the things that mattered most to him. And I think I could summarize in one word, just one word, what mattered most to him. And that one word is you. All of you. Well, I guess all of you is three words. But Steve is all about relationships. And even though I haven't met most of you in person, I feel like I know many of you because he talked about you so often. Naturally, Patty was a part of our conversations. And I observed the power of a committed relationship as I watched the two of them together. Had Steve lived another six months and two days, they would have celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. Six months and two days. Together they raised their children, Scott and Cheryl and Paul. And though I had only known Steve myself for the last six months of his life, I'm so grateful for those six months and that I got to know him. I met a man who loved his family, had the gift of gab, and loved to tell stories. He knew no stranger. 
could be a bit stubborn. Well, okay, maybe he could be a lot stubborn at times. But often it served him well. And did I say how much he loved his family? I mentioned earlier the committed relationship that he and Patty shared. And as I've worked with hospice now for about six years, I've come to realize that rarely does a couple have any understanding of what they're really pledging to each other when they say their wedding vows, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Because when those vows are made, we simply don't know the ups and downs and the twists and turns that life will take us on. I'm sure as a young couple, Patty and Steve had no idea that one day he would develop a debil debilitating disease like Parkinson's disease. I think it was challenging for Steve to lose his own autonomy and to have to depend on Patty so much those last number of years. And I know at times Patty got frustrated by his fierce independence and determination to do things on his own, his own way. But even in those moments, I observed the grace that they had for each other, grace that came from a lifelong committed love and relationship with each other. Now, as a hospice chaplain, I spend a lot of time doing what we call life review, which really is listening to the stories of a person's life and helping them discover what brought them meaning and purpose throughout their lives. Steve needed, Steve needed no help in identifying what brought him the most joy. Hands down, it was his family. If I heard it once, I heard, I'm sure I heard it a half dozen times or more. How much what he really wanted to do was to move all the furniture in the living room, put down a blanket on the floor, and just wrestle around with the grandbabies. Unfortunately, both distance and his physical limitations made that more of a longing than a reality. But I suspect he did that with his children and grandchildren when they were young. I know there's that little that sign over there directed just specifically for babies, that uh, poster board. So yeah, he loved his babies. And I also know that he gave each one of his kids, grandkids and everybody along the way, a, a nickname that was very special to them. Um, and that's really pretty cool. Now I had the opportunity to watch um, the life celebration video this morning that's on the website here. And I think Steve was happiest when he was holding a baby. Again, I heard so many stories and saw so many pictures when I visited that I feel like I know many of you, even though we've not met. Steve loved his extended family as well. Family was just important to him, and he loved the gatherings that he had with his siblings and cousins and nieces and nephews. And he loved his dad's old red truck. I heard lots of stories about that red truck and saw many pictures with it as the stage for family gatherings and the background for pictures. Not only did Steve love his immediate family and his extended family, but he just was a people person. And again, I think he knew no stranger. He enjoyed connecting with his old friends and making new friends along the way. He and Patty had moved to Gaston a few years back so that Cheryl could assist more with his care. But they would often enjoy a meal at one of the local restaurants as they made new acquaintances but they also stayed really connected to their friends back here in Tipton County. And they often talked about meeting up with those friends when they were back in town for business, which seemed to be pretty often. Now what I'm not so sure Steve was aware of was the powerful impact and influence he had on other people's lives. He was a pretty modest man, and I think he even once told me that he was just a dumb old farmer. Now in today's world, Farming is high tech, a high tech enterprise, something that I have little to no understanding of. In one of my visits, he shared, or maybe it was more Patty that shared, because again, I think he was being humble, but they shared about how he had developed some equipment for combines that were um, a huge time saver during harvest season. I met with some of the family earlier this week, and Scott helped explain just what those pieces of equipment did, and it's, uh, again, they eventually were patented. And the nature of the equipment is too complex for me to even try to explain, but um, just leave it to say that Steve was innovative and accomplished in the work that he did. I think those two words served him well. He was innovative and accomplished. Steve was also a mentor to younger employees in his company, and there's probably no better way to describe that than the words that I read on 
one of the condolences that was left on the website. Dan Reif, and I don't know if Dan's in the room at all or not, but he, he wrote the following condolence. He said, I worked alongside Steve, first as I was a kid, and also later as an adult. He was the most wonderful companion to work with, always pleasant, careful, helpful, and an excellent teacher, especially to a kid just starting out. Today, so many years later, I find myself regularly experiencing his presence as I go about my own life. How would Steve go about fixing this? Or what withering comment might Steve have about that? And of course, there was the, the all-consuming laugh that might erupt even before he got to the end of the tale. Well done, good peace, my friend. And Dan, thank you again if you were here. Those were just such, such touching words. Another way Steve inspired others was through the way he handled his farming accident back in 2013 when he had to have his left leg amputated below the knee. The loss of a limb that way can often be devastating to an individual, leading to discouragement, grief, and sometimes depression. But that was not Steve. Though I didn't know him then, then I'm told he handled that loss with such grace and perseverance that he became a source of inspiration and encouragement to others who had experienced similar losses, often being called by the staff where he was doing his rehab to speak to others who were just beginning their own journey of recovery. And even though life had handed him a number of challenges, he never complained. He had a very, he had a way of turning lemons into lemonade and held to the adage that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Now I don't want to paint a picture that Steve was perfect. He was very human like all of us. As a father, he could be a stern disciplinarian showing tough love sometimes that felt a little too tough. And he could certainly be ornery. When the kids were little and got in trouble, he would make them sit with their arms around each other. <laughs> and Cheryl remembered once as a teenager trying to sneak into the house after her curfew. The house was dark and quiet, and she tiptoed around the corner to suddenly hear in a loud, stern voice, just what do you think you're doing? Scaring her half to death. But it's some of that orneriness that endeared us to him. Now the other important part of me doing life review with Steve was to help him become more aware of God's presence in his life. Steve told me up front when I first started visiting with him that he wasn't religious, but he certainly was open to things of God. I think he just had a quiet personal faith. But as I learned to know him and as I continued to hear more of his story, it reminded me of a song I heard on the radio called Evidence by Josh Baldwin. I'm just gonna share a few words from um, that song, the first verse in the chorus. It says, all throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring in every season from where I'm standing. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. And that's what I invited Steve to do during our visits as he reflected on his own life, inviting him to see the places where God had met him and walked with him, in his family, in his friends, in his work, and even in his sufferings. And I hope you too can see the evidence of God's goodness all over Steve's life, because each of you are a part of that goodness. And maybe you can see his goodness in your own life too. Pray with me one more time. Loving God, um, thank you for the many evident evidences of your love and goodness and grace in Steve's life. Thank you for your promise to always be with us and just continue to open our eyes so we too can see you working and moving in our own lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Before we continue, the family would like you to know that at the end of the service, you will be given an opportunity to share any remembrances that you would like uh, with your relationship with Steve. So you might be thinking upon those, and you'll be given that opportunity. 
I'm Reverend Judy Purvis, and uh, my husband David Purvis is a cousin to Steve. And um, his cousin's his Judy. Falling just a few days before his death, Steve lost his hard fought battle against Parkinson's disease. He was always a strong man who fought for life and independence even during the last months of his life. And he will sorely be missed by family and by friends. When Jesus was asked to read the scripture lesson at his home synagogue in Nazareth when he was just beginning his ministry, he turned to the passage of Isaiah, which better than any other described the basis of his ministry. And that is found in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 4, verse 18, and it reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and let the oppressed go free. One of the reasons Jesus came to earth was to bind up the brokenhearted. And he was an ambassador of God's comfort. Healing was always a very important part of Jesus' ministry. You take away the healing ministries, the healing miracles from the gospel record, and a large and essential element is lost. In all of his healing work, Jesus went beyond the body to the spirit. And I marvel at the way our Lord understood people. He realized the burdens they carried as though every burden rested upon his shoulders. It was Jesus who said, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whatever might be that burden, whether it be a burden of loneliness, sadness, loss, and please hear these additional words of comfort from God's holy word. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul, and he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. and words from John 14, various verses. Do not let your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would not have told you that I would go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you will be also. And I will not leave you orphaned, Jesus says. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. And then verse 27 of chapter 14. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. As I talk to family and friends over the past days, as Amy has done, the one phrase that kept coming over and over with regard to Steve was, he had a sparkle in his eye. He was a bit stubborn, as Amy alluded to, maybe definitely a lot stubborn, but he was fun-loving and he was funny, caring, and had that sparkle in his eye. 
His mom would, well, make him sit at the table until he finished his supper. Well, so she thought she would make him sit at the table until he finished his supper. But Steve had his way. He would sit there and sit there and sit there until finally Marie would say, all right, you can get up, you can go. Because if Steve didn't want to do it, he didn't do it. But if he wanted to do it, you couldn't stop him. As a teenager, on Saturday nights after dates were taken home, obviously when he was a teenager, Bob White had remembered Steve and their buddies meeting at the courthouse square. Were any of you a part of that group? Hopping in one of the cars and either heading to Kokomo to McDonald's or to Indianapolis, guess to where? White Castle. <laughs> he wouldn't drive. <laughs> And how many sisses could there be in one room? <laughs> you got it. All of them. All of them. As many girls as there were in the room, that's how many sisses there were in the room. They were all sis to Steve. And if you were gutsy and rambunctious and a brave girl, what were you called? Toughie. Steve had a name for everyone. And he was caring. Funny, fun-loving, but he was caring. Larry wanted me to share this story about when he was a kid at St. John's. When Bob, Kathy, and I were in the first through the second grades at St. John's, Uncle Steve was in the eighth grade. Okay, can you get that picture? We all rolled the same bus because at that time we lived in the Brady place. Oh my goodness. I think everybody lived at the Brady Place at one time or another, even my husband. My cousin Dave lived at the Brady Place for a while. Well, so they lived just uh, in the Brady Place, just down on Division Road from the Letzinger Farm. Then my dad had a car wash business in Tipton, in an old wooden building not far from the school, with a wood-burning stove in it. Somehow, Bob, Kathy, and I decided instead of getting on the bus, we'd walk down to that car wash without telling anyone. Well, this story doesn't end too well, <laughs> as you can imagine. Well, the bus driver and Steve, Uncle Steve, knew that we had not gotten on the bus, and it was being winter, and so they told Father Wolski, and a search began. Uncle Steve, bless his heart, Larry says, remembered about my dad's little business down the street. He ran down there and rounded us up, said my dad wasn't there, probably returning cars to some of the local dealers. Steve found us cold and scared, called off the search, got us on the bus home to one mad mama. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Steve. We love you. His cousin Dan Purvis also remembers Steve even as a younger boy, yet still supporting and caring for family. As a very little boy, Dan, who lived in town, was taught to look both ways before crossing a street. That carried over with Dan even to the driveway of the Lutzinger farm. So playing and running around on the farm, when Dan came to the driveway, he stopped all of a sudden and asked Steve, is it all right to cross? Steve could have laughed, could have made fun of such a silly question, but he didn't. He simply asked, is there anything coming? Dan said, no. And Steve said, then it's okay to cross. Dan never has forgotten that kindness. But that sparkle in his eye seems to really define Steve, stubborn, ornery, fun-loving, funny, but that sparkle in his eye. Do you nieces and nephews remember being at Grandma Letzinger's house at Christmas running round and round and round that circular, right, okay, that circular house? The men in the dining room and the women in the kitchen. And after a while, your Uncle Steve, with a stern look, startled you to get your attention, thinking he was going to beat you up then the sparkle in his eye. And he would laugh and then use that as an opening to do what? <laughs> to tell you a story. 
And that sparkle was never brighter than when it came to his grandson, uh, grandkids, grandchildren, granddaughters, and grandsons again, as Amy mentioned various times. Just days before he died, the grandkids vid video called Steve. He could not speak, but they talked and told him about how much they loved him. When they hung up, tears came to his eyes. He knew that would be the last time he would probably hear their voices. He loved his family and never seemed happier, as Amy said, than when he was with family. Now, Bob Whitehead says that Steve loved his friends, but Steve could not be tempted to do anything with his young buddies if he had already made it a commitment to Patty to do something else. She was his first love and treated her like gold. Yet he would love to get her goat. Did he ever get your goat? <laughs> quite a few times. <laughs> quite a few times. When Steve and Patty would stop to see his niece Connie at the Kokomo Lowe's, he always had an exaggerated and playful story to tell about how he made, made Patty do something. And Patty would roll her eyes and laugh. And as Connie was remembering Steve with great fun, as she said, who else? Who else would stop every time they were in Kokomo to see her? Who else would take the time to stop at Lowe's and find out if she was there or not? I said, well, Steve and Patty would. He loved family. Always polite, always courteous. He would do anything for you. I wasn't going to mention this, but it's just too good seeing that John Deere tractor and their truck and all. Um, Bob remembers that when they were um, not teenagers by any means, but as, uh, older, his car wasn't working and the engine was kaput, didn't have any money, I don't think. I don't think I'm telling stories out of telling money for a new car. Maybe he did. And Steve said, I'll tell you what, just bring the car over and we'll take the engine off and we'll put a new one in. And Bob said, we're not going to take that engine out and put a new one in. Said, yes, we are. I'll help you out. I'll help you out. That was just Steve, always wanting to help out. But I don't think Bob let him do it. He said, how can we do that in just a couple days? But Steve was willing to give it a shot. As each of you remember Steve's in your own special way, may there be an abiding gratitude to God for the time you shared with Steve and the gratitude of the hope of immortality which faith in our Lord gives within us. May you know that Steve is in the hands of a merciful and compassionate God where rest and peace and love are God's good gifts. At a time like this, at the death of a loved one, we are reminded that our bodies do not serve us forever. We might like to think that they do, but they don't. We are called to a new dedication. The end of life on earth summons you and me to consider the end for which life is to be lived. When Jesus was asked by a young lawyer, what did he have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, well, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the young man replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus replied, you are given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But in spite of our best efforts, our best achievements, we are still left dependent upon the mercy of a forgiving God. At the end of each day and at the end of our earthly lives, we entrust our own lives and the lives of the ones we love to God with the words of this psalmist into thy hands I commit my spirit may each of you here turn to God and each other and each other for comfort in your time of grief and to God through Christ for right living and eternal life let us pray God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even to this day, for the gift of joy in days of health and strength, 
and for the gift of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and for friends. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knows our grief, who died our death, and rose for our sake. In Christ's holy name we pray these things. Now at this time, some family members, Kent and Ashley, would like to share some special music. of you who don't know me, I'm Kent, or uh, as Papa liked to call me, Buster. Um, my sister, Shay, uh, couldn't be here with us today. Um, I know it broke her heart. And so um, I asked if uh, there was anything that she'd like for me to read. Uh, and 
um, she sent some memories um, that I think really speak to um, the heart of who our, our grandpa was. Um, so this is in her words. I wrote this one a couple of years ago before Mamma and Papa moved out to Gaston about uh, one of Ashley and my last visits to the house in Kempton. This is called the museum. At Mamma and Papa's, there's a small museum in the Eden portion of the kitchen. On the wood paneled wall between the washer and dryer and the window is a proud exhibition of their baby's work. Bank post-its with abstract sketches, misspelled odes to grandparents, and clumsy writing are accompanied by even clumsier drawings. The scotch tape used to hang them is visible floating just above each piece, all of them produced by the boys of our brood, the youngest. Last Christmas, Ashley and I decided to remedy that. The file cabinet still smelled like crayons, the coloring books were still there, along with the plastic kitchenette and assorted other toys they just couldn't part with yet. With our coloring books and the still functional crayons, we laid down on the worn blue carpet and colored, teasing each other as Papa took his leg off and watched us grin si with that sideways grin. I wondered if this was the first time he really smiled since the accident. It took us a while because we were careful and because we didn't want his smile to disappear. Our meticulously outlined and shaded masterpieces, once finished, were added to the sacred exhibition. They now had all their favorite artists, Punky Doll, Doll Baby, Buster, Butch, Lil Bub. This Christmas, they welcomed us with two boxes of 96 crayons and two coloring books, hoping that Punky Doll and Doll Baby would oblige them, allow them to commission two more pieces. How could we say no to that? Papaw grinned the whole time we colored. This is called one of Papaw's favorite stories. It's summer and I'm no more than four. I'm wearing my favorite candy cane striped dress. We're at Mamaw and Papaw's, which meant it must have been a weekend. The porch juts out from the brick shingles. I'm dancing, twirling, as Papaw's boots move closer to the concrete stairs. He smells sweaty. He was always working on something. He smiles and his eyes dance in the, crinkle, in the crinkles his tan cheeks make. I'm happy and smiling. You have such pretty dimples, he says. I misunderstand and pull the top of my dress down to look at my nipples. <laughs> his laughter comes from deep in his belly. And though I don't know exactly why he's laughing, I relish the sound. This one's called a favorite memory. When I was little, Mamma and Papa rented a small plot from a neighbor, not far away from where they grew a garden. Or not not far away where they grew a garden. We would stand outside with Mamma and wait for the shiny black El Camino to pull around. According to farm rules, I was big enough and old enough to ride in the bed. Even though we were probably only going five to ten miles an hour, it still felt like freedom. At the garden, the earth had always or the, at the garden, the earth had always already been turned, its rich brown shade warming under the sun. Papal's voice was always patient as he showed us where and how far down we should put the seed. My small fingers were gentle as they placed the possibility of life and nourishment in the ground. The dirt felt like the sunlight on my back, warm and invigorating. I felt connected, I felt free, and I'll never forget it. Thanks, Papa. Just one more story. Papa liked to tell stories. Seemed like everyone in the family does. He had his favorites, though. Once he loved to tell on repeat that made the corners of his mouth turn up and his eyes gleam. One was about how he'd get so tired of reading the same books to Ashley and me that he'd put them on the shelf backwards, hoping that we wouldn't recognize the book if we couldn't see the spine. It never worked, though. He would always chuck through his words at the memory of us sticking our hooked fingers out and finding them away. Anyway, forced to read them, 
He changed the words, only to suffer blows from our small elbows because we were just too clever and persistent to suffer that ornery noise. I had a unique experience last winter. Um, I came, uh, I was in the middle of preparing to move from one coast to the opposite coast and uh, was looking for something to do for money and uh, I know that Mamma was needing help because uh, caring for someone constantly is uh, a, a, an exhausting activity not because of who Papa was but just because of the 24-hour nature of um, care that was needed and so I volunteered to help out and so for 24 hours of the day basically if Papa was up I was up whether it was three o'clock in the morning having donuts and coffee or if it was you know seven o'clock at night and Papa was going to bed I'd sit there and talk to him from the side of his bed um, listening to stories and telling stories and I think that my, my vision, my perception of Papa was a character who was larger than life. Um, he made an impression that is going to stick with me forever. And uh, I think that the depth of his character, he was the last person that if you did something wrong, you didn't want Papa to find out. <laughs> you would, cause, because you know that the disappointment is something that would hurt worse than mom and dad being disappointed. Um, and it's not that he would yell, it's the look in his eyes when you know that you can do better because he knows you can do better. Um, but he was also a very gentle person in that if you needed anything or if you had something to talk about, he was there to listen and there to offer you anything that he had. I would be so full that I'd need to unbutton my pants just to sit comfortably and he'd still be trying to offer me any, anything that they had in their fridge and in their cabinets. Um, he could tell a story like no one else. Even if you'd heard it a hundred times, you never got tired of hearing it. And every once in a while, you'd catch an extra piece of the story that maybe you had missed the first 99 times. <laughs> <laughs> and seeing him, you know, with the uh, his therapists and his nurses to hear the things that were happening in his life that he still was excited to share uh, on each visit. He never lost his desire to live and he never lost his love of life and the people that um, he came into contact with on a daily basis. And I feel really fortunate to be a part of his family and have him be a part of my family. And he's, if I could be half a man that he is, that's a good life lived. Are there any stories, any remembrances that you would like to share? We'll pause and give some time for that. I remember when I was a teenager, we had just gotten a motorcycle. 
and I'm not very tall. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I couldn't really touch the ground very good. I managed to stretch out long enough to get one tiptoe down on one side, and Dad said, well, sis, if you can touch, you can ride it. And so they fired it up, and he taught me how to shift gears and what to do. So he let me go off, and we lived at a place where you had to kind of go uphill into the driveway. And he failed to mention that there was a dip at the end of the drive. And so I took off on it and turned around and came back without Crash. And then, by the way, that was my nickname, Crash. Um, and I stopped at the end of the drive where the dip was and I put my feet down and there was no ground there. So he laughed because I did an Artie Johnson over onto the thing. Um, I kind of felt bad because I thought he might be more interested if I was hurt or not, but he didn't really seem to care because he was too busy laughing. But I learned from that day that, Dad let me try stuff. He let me be me. He always encouraged me. I would ask what he thought, and he would just give me the wisdom that some things you have to figure out on your own. He wasn't always the nicest person, and he and Mom in the later years, I would go over and they would be bickering back and forth because when he got me alone, he would say, Sis, your mom's got too much power and it's gone to her head. <laughs> and I said, Dad, I know, what do you do? <laughs> She's trying her best. So I enjoyed the times that we got to spend together when mom would go and get her hair done. We would go to the Menards, which was always a fiasco because he wanted to ride in the little cart that they had, but they didn't only have one speed on it. And when you turned around, he would just about take out every end cap that they had. So you had to make sure that you were out of his way. But it was good to do that with him. He's a good teacher and I'm forever grateful for all the lessons. Some of them not so easy, but I do again like Kent. I hope I'm half the person he was. I know sometimes it takes a little bit of courage and a little bit of time to get that courage. So I don't want to hurry you. Well, for a blessing as we part. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.